So we're going to cover chapter 10 today. Some of my stuff here. And this chapter is a little bit more lengthy as we have to talk about different things related to encryption. And then for our lab this week, we'll do a little bit. I'm trying, I think I'm going to give you some experience in setting up certificates. Um, as this industry requires that type of skill more. And then we'll, we'll use like an easy encryption. So you have some knowledge and skill in that. Okay, let me zoom in and then I'll project and screen capture. I forgot to do that last time at the beginning. So on laptop. So let's take a look at the notes and the assignments. We'll start in a minute. So we are covering unit 10 today. Hi. Hi. We're going to work on encryption and hash this week. Along with we're going to talk about um, certificate and all the good stuff related to encryption. I did activate your practice test for Security Plus as I was telling everyone that I could only link the 501 in practice lab and they claim that 601 is available but I don't see it anywhere in the API. So um, I had sent out a message to them and asked to see if I can have access to their 601. But let me show you where that's at. Okay. So when you log on Canvas, it's right below your existing module for this week, which is unit 10. And it will just keep dropping until when we add additional units. So as you know that we only have one more chapter to go, which is chapter 11 in the textbook. There are only 11 chapters. So what will happen to the time, right? Um, I will spend a little bit of time to give you a little bit more hands-on practice in some of the areas we didn't touch on, like we missed some exercise with the wireless lab. So we'll come back to that. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more We'll do some activity and we're going to do some final review. But um, if you see this, right, I activated. So there are two rounds in the practice test. And this is supposed to, to help you prepare for the certification. So it's good that you go through it. The first one is a learning mode where your goal is to get 100% in that. It should be really easy. It gives you the answer. So you pick your answer and if you don't know, you can look at the hint. So the learning mode is supposed to help you learn, okay? Then I had activated the exam mode. So after you complete this, which is due on the 15th, you still have a couple of weeks on for that, right? And it's 90 minutes, 90 questions, like a regular CompTIA certification. Then after you complete this with 100%, you can do this. And you can do it as many times as you wish. Every time that you do, your score resets. But I recommend that when you have a good score, take a screen capture of your score. Do not trust the cloud system. I've had incident where students took the, ex the practice test and then their score didn't port through. So make sure that we take screen capture, okay, for both, okay, but especially this one. And there's a percentage of your grade is going to be based on this. So our goal for this one is 100%. All you have to do is click on it and then click this button. It's going to take you to practice test or practice lab, right? And then your goal is to get 100%. So if you complete all the questions, it's going to give you 100%. Then on the next one, it, it's going to be exam mode. So this treat this like a real test, right? Make sure that we go through the questions. 
And our goal is to get 80% or higher. That's how you pass your certification. So many of my students that did this doing the online class, they passed the Security Plus last July before they changed the test. Now the new exam, it, they restructure it. So the categories are a little bit different, but the components is the same. I use a new book because I want to prep you for the new certification. So do this. And then if you have the book, do the practice question in the book. That's gonna help you, okay? And when you have it fresh in your mind, sit for the exam and I'm trying to get you the free voucher for the test. So all else, if you don't wanna do the A plus or the network plus, do the security plus if you are in cybersecurity. That's gonna get your foot in the door in many jobs, okay? And then after that, you can do pen test plus, ethical hacking, whatever you want, but do the security plus first because that's the, that's the base, okay? So 90 minutes, 90 questions. There are one question, one minute per question. I cannot change accessibility on the actual CompTIA test for you, but so let's try to simulate it. And if you are not happy with your score, do it again, right? Do it until you're happy with your score. And it does update it every few hours, not right away. So spend some time to do this. And the, the exam portion, the practice, this one, the assessment, it's not due until June, so you do have some time on that. So start with the learn mode first, okay? All right, so let's talk about encryption. So encryption is very important in this field. Uh, encryption, how strong is the encryption? It's really based on the key and the algorithm. So we're gonna talk about different types of encryption. So many people say, oh, just implement encryption, but there's resources that you would need to put in. So Encryption is a way that we can convert plain text is into something that's not readable. Things like account information, account numbers, uh, personal identifiable information, um, things that could be related to important design or proprietary products. So encryption gives you integrity, confidentiality, non-repudiation, and more. Right, so the integrity is that when you encrypt something, the data in that cannot be changed, okay? And it uses what's called a hash, which is a number numerical value that's calculated to give you a fixed length string. And this can be shown in hexadecimal characters or could most of the time in hexadecimal characters. Encryption also gives you confidentiality to make sure that the proper people are going to be accessing the data. It's only for a certain authorized user. So if I encrypt the file and if it's intended for you, you will be able to decrypt it. Anybody in between will not be able to break it. That's the idea, right? But hash can be, can be jeopardized. So in the first question, it asks you, how can hash be used for data integrity? The way that we use hash is we use a, an algorithm, which is a, a, based on a mathematical formula that calculates, right, the data or the file and generate a string. This supposedly is not reversible or recreate the original data. So once you create that data and you use a hash algorithm, it generates this value based on the computation. And that value is gonna be telling you that that data is authentic. That means that it's not reversible or changed, okay? And so when we download a file, right, on the page of the download, it says this file has this hash value. You can use a hash generator to compute the file that you downloaded as a hash value and see if it's matching. If it is exactly the same, then it has integrity. If it is different, then that means that it lacks integrity. Something happened in your download, maybe a corrupted uh, portion of the data existed or an intervention, right? Somebody that is intervening and changing your data. So once you have the hash value, then you, it can be compared 
right, to the original hash to be able to see if the data is altered. So when you create a password in your system, let's say I create a password for my user account, the password is stored with a hash value. Now, if, if somebody access my account and change the password, right, that means that it's been altered, then the hash should be different. <coughs> So, bless you. so your OS actually store your password as hash values, and that's what it used to make sure that your password it has integrity. Okay, what we saw when we use using clean, right, all we have to do is crack the hash in order to get to the password that is short, right, or even long if we have time. So in encryption, the way that we have integrity is that encryption is going to give us the data assurance in that it's not modified. Integrity just means that data hasn't been modified and the hash ensure that the data retains integrity. So it is a numerical value that is used for matching to make sure that the data hasn't been changed. In confidentiality, it ensures that the data is only intended for a certain user. So if I encrypt a file and I send it to that certain user, only that person is supposed to be able to decrypt my file. Or if I encrypt my file for myself to see, I can only decrypt that. That's the intention. Encryption is to make sure that the data is confidential in that it converts the plain text, what we see in human text, into something that is not readable. And that's the whole point, right? So if we have secret data, we can encrypt it so that way only us, only we can view that, the data, not other people. Now, you do see some website that said, this is the checksum value, right? Checksum is different than hash and people tend to mix them up in that hash is a much longer string. When you're looking at a hash value, it's usually like any character, right? And it would be in hexadecimal, which is different than your counting number in decimal. In a checksum, usually checksum is used for smaller data. And it used about a couple of bits to really verify the integrity of that data. So the intention of use for both of these things are the same. But checksum is a, intended for much smaller data and it's using a smaller storage to verify the data, okay? So when you're looking at a checksum, the number is much shorter, okay? a couple of bits compared to a hash that can go up to 512 or thousands of bits. Okay, so depending, so for example, MD5 is definitely crackable and MD5 hash is 128 bits. And if you're using SHA, S-H-A, SHA-3, which is what we're using currently, that can go up to 512 or higher. So the, the higher the hash size, the better it is, because remember that in security, we're buying time, right? So if you have a very large size hash algorithm, right, the length of it is longer, it takes the attacker longer to brute force it or to crack it. And, you know, you can use off crack, you can use you know, all kinds of different hash comparison type of tool, but ultimately we want to do something longer so we'll buy more time. Okay. And we hope that if it's long enough, they will give up and not, not attack, right? So that brings us to different type of hashes. Do you have any questions for me? So understanding encryption would require you to understand hash, right? And other things that comes along with encryption. 
and we use encryption in everything. The time you log in to pay your bill, to downloading web applications and playing your game, right? All your HTTPS use encryption to accessing your wireless router at home, you're using encryption. So we use encryption in a lot of things, but there are different types of encryption, okay? And you can find this in on the notes as well. Any question? Okay, so let's come back to the notes here. So in confidentiality, a lot of times when we select encryption, we have to think about performance and, and confidentiality and integrity, right? So a lot of the time we waiver those areas of security for performance. So for example, if you're using HTTPS websites to pay your bills or transfer money in your account or you know pay your student loan, whatever it is, right? You're using symmetric key encryption. That means that you have a key to encrypt and that will be the same key to decrypt. That's like your house key. You use that key to lock and unlock your house, right? So that's symmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryption uses two different keys, one to encrypt and the other to decrypt. So if I'm using my public key to encrypt, and I publish that because public key is, it can be shared, right? Then I decrypt using my private key and that's called the PKI, public key infrastructure. And some algorithm uses that, but it's slower, right? And it uses more resource. So when you use Raspberry Pi or Linux that uses RSA for authentication, or when you're logging into your switches and router for authentication, it uses RSA. That is the type of asymmetric encryption. What about SSL? SSL uses symmetric. So anything web, right? Like HTTPS, and we'll touch on that, uses symmetric. Why? Because it's fast and it's easy. Okay. But with that, we we waiver because there's some flaw in SSL, we waiver some of the issues in, in that type of encryption. Okay. All right. Now, also, there are different, in, when you deal with data, there's different type of encryption or cipher. There's the stream that's going to be one bit at a time. That means it's going to encrypt one bit at a time, and it's going to, it's going to send. That's your web traffic, right? So when you're using SSL or TLS and HTTPS, that's stream cipher. But when you're using block cipher, it's going to chunk the data into increments and it's going to encrypt each group of bits. Okay. And then here it talks about steganography to really hide the data or embed it. Right. We can use it for security or attack can use it for to embed malware. There's different things. And then authentication uses encryption. Right. If you're using like, you know, um, authenticate me through Facebook, Google, et cetera, right? It passes the token through API. It's still web-based authentication. So it requires some form of encryption. And then digital signature to authenticate, uh, it shows authenticity in the signer. You are who you say you are, okay? And then non-repudiation that you cannot argue that, oh, I didn't sign that, right? If you sign something, it puts a timestamp on it and it notes that you did that and it generates an event based on that incident, that event, right? That occurrence. Okay, so we talked about checksum and hash already. Let's talk about different type of hashes. So there's MD5 and MD5 is definitely susceptible to attack, right? It was developed in early 90s was changed right over time but was fully the vulnerability was fully discovered in 2004 so md5 is not strong right but it's still used in a lot of things okay it's used in email and files encryption and storage and downloads if you ever visit websites for download it says here's your md5 hash right it's used in executable files even though it has flaws, okay? 
Then we have the sha, the SHA. Zero is not used. One is the updated version. It is 160 bit hash. Remember I said the size matters, okay? SHA one is, you can have 256 by bits. Um, 512 is the preferred or even 224 and 384. So how do they generate this? And a lot of these things is using prime numbers, right? Depending on the algorithm. SHA-3 is what we are implementing now. So SHA-2 was created by the NSA, okay? SHA-3 is not made by the NSA. And so in SHA, okay, basically you can capture the information, but it is SHA-3 is what's known as a good hash. So for the next one, when should you use the MD5? Okay, even though it's widely used in email file, storage, downloads, executable file, but in my opinion, it should not be used. Okay, well, the industry recommendation, you should not use MD5. Okay, so when you are working for a company and they are using MD5, right, you should recommend that they upgrade and it's not, it might be a challenge because certain legacy systems use MP5, you cannot just change, right? Uh, certain application they have that requires MP5 and so on, okay? So consider other algorithm or other encryption that is not accessible to attack. And we'll talk about different types of attack that can be used against hash and encryption. Now, NSA created SHA-1 and SHA-2, but not SHA-3, which is known as the CCATS. So being removed from the NSA design, right, using a different approach. So the, the idea is to really implement a solution that will be diverse. And we talked about the defense in depth last time. So the same concept is applied in encryption in that if you do implement encryption in your system and networks, we want to consider the diversity in the encryption and how we use the encryption for what purpose. Okay, so before we do exercise six, okay, I want to touch on a few things. Actually, let's come back to the HMAP. Let's do exercise six. So I don't want to take your mind away from generating a hash. So I added this because I felt like students know about hash and they read up. You can Google anything these days, right? You can watch tutorial videos. So I want you to see how that can be done in a Windows environment. How can I use a utility to generate my hash key? So we can start with doing CMD, open up your command prompt like this, okay? And then here, I want you to change to a folder or a location where you put your file. So for now, we're gonna go to desktop, okay? So we're gonna do a change directory to desktop, which is the next step here. Then you're gonna make a file. And it, this can be any file, but for the sake of our exercise, we're gonna do a file called secret.txt. So we're gonna use the echo command. So we're gonna do echo, right? This is a secret file. We're gonna append that string to secret. I'm gonna call it secret one, cause I already have, I tested this. So you just point it to a file. Okay, so if you already have a file that exists, you don't have to do this step, right? You just go to the folder where you have that file and you're gonna use the utility to generate the hash. So how can I make a hash, right? By using a cert util hash file and then your file name and the hash type, okay? Windows supported MD5, so depending on your OS, right? If you have 
use a certain third party ones, you're going to make sure that that's, uh, that's installed. So we're going to use the cert util. And then the option is going to be hash file and then your file name. So your file has to exist at the location where you're using that utility, you see? So here, Double check. Yeah, so all I need to do is tell it MD5. So there, what it did was it took that file, right? And it computed the hash value using MD5, which is 128 bits. And it gives me that, that key, that value, you see? So that's my hash value for the file, my secret one.txt file that's there. Now, later on, let's say a month from now, right? I loan my computer to someone or somebody use login and use my computer. And I wanted to see if that, if that file has been modified. What can I do? I would recompute the hash value and see if it's exact match. If it's exactly the same, then it has not been, been jeopardized. It has not been changed. But if it is different, that that means that I know that somebody tampered with my file. You see? Yeah. So that's how you can really use a hash to check to see if a file has integrity. Okay? Any question? Yeah, but in in IT, what we can do is we can write a script to, to do this for us, right? Because the human makes errors, so we can tell the computer to do it. So I would write a tool to do that instead. I'm sure there's a tool that the developer created for that already. Okay, any question? Okay, so answer this question. Once you have that hash, you can copy and paste it over for your answer and then close command prompt. Okay, so let's talk about HMAC. Make sure we know these acronyms and terminology for certification. This is the industry that use a lot of acronyms, right? The protocols are acronyms, the terms are acronyms. So make sure we remember that. Okay, so HMAC stands for Hash Based Message Authentication Code. Very similar to what you've seen. We talked about hash already. It's very similar to MD5 and SHA1. So it uses, so IPsec and TLS, TLS, you know already, that's used for HTTPS, the secure website that you visit. IPsec is used for remote access right for your remote access server so i can you create a vpn to connect these people right to their work computers and so on using ipsec ip security okay so these two protocols uses hmac with the md5 extension in the sha1 you know we know the md5 has flaws so is sha1 that's why we have sha2 and sha3 right so the process is that it's gonna create the hash. Let's say you send the data to me. So it's gonna create the hash on your computer. If in any case that it's being jeopardized by an attacker, the, when the receiver received that hash, the modified hash is then compared. So if just like what we talked about when we did the MD5, it is different, right? We know that the data is jeopardized. So HMAC, it, use, it creates a key, and that key is shared between the sender and the receiver. And so using that key, I can then compare the hashes to make sure it's a match. If it is not matching, then I know that my data has been jeopardized in between, right? Send and receive. So it gives you this right here, okay? And then 
Also with that, we have race integrity primitive evaluation message digest. It's a mouthful, I know. This is a hash function to really determine the integrity. It's used in MD5, SHA, and HMAC. It is a 160-bit fixed size hash, okay? But there are versions for 128, 256, 320, and so on. So in my opinion, overall, when you're using hashes, anything below 256 is compromisable, okay? doesn't matter which technology because again right they can iterate through and they can try a, ma a match for your hash it's definitely there are tools to crack this just processing power and time so um with that said we can answer the next few questions okay so which protocols at, that uses uh hmac we talked about ipsec ip security that's used for vpn for remote access TLS, that's in your HTTPS, used for website. And the version that's used is HMAC MD5 and SHA-1. So how can they attack hash, right? So there is a process called hash collision. And hash collision is that in, there is a small probability that two hashes can match for two different files so ideally if i have that file and a different file file one and file two they should have two different hash values right but there is a small possibility that we can have a hash collision in the same algorithm meaning that file one and file two generate the same hash value okay so in a hash collision the algorithm creates the same hash for two different inputs. That could be two file, right? It could be, you know, um, two things, two sets of data, okay? And MD5 is susceptible to hash collision, okay? So to really attack MD5, you need to Any question? Okay, so now, so here we talked about hash can be used for passwords, right? But it can also be used for file. You just saw that here it defines what a hash collision is on page two of your notes, okay? And in the password attack, the easiest way, right? You saw how to brute force. Brute force takes forever, especially if you have really long passphrase, right? User don't just create simple password anymore. So what they can do is they can simply use, even in brute force, in an online attack for password, number one, they're gonna try to brute force, but we can implement policy rules to set where, you know, tried and fail then we can lock them out they can also call and get you to give them the password in an offline attack what they can do is they can capture right a lot of the time password is stored in a database so for example you create an account an online account to access your email your account and your password is stored in a database they can find that database and download it. And all they have to do is to locate the column where it says password and that's how they access it. And this is why database injection, SQL injection is so popular is because we can find so much data through SQL injection. So in the past, the hash attack, in order to attack for password, right? They're gonna look for the protocol. And you saw this in Kane when we did this in Kane, right? We saw that it it Kane attacked NTLM and the NTLM manager, right? The land manager, which is still being used in Windows today. Okay, even though it's old protocol. 
And so in that, you have to access it at the administrator privilege. So they have to find the account that allow them to access, like account that doesn't require authentication and so on, okay? Or they can simply pull the security agent in actual windows that use in token. So how can I access network resources? It uses a SAM, which is a database that store, right, your security privileges for the system. And the server passes that to the system. So they will find where that's located, access that server, find your security manager database, and then be able to access that. So all of the, the encryption and the hash really ties back into authentication and access control. And this comes back to the beginning, right? I told you that all the security issues, the potential issues really lies within the control of access, okay? And so access control, which is authentication and, and so on. familiar with this so when I teach the speech structure we go over pigeonholes equations and uh, and so on right so the idea is that if there are 35 people in the room there's a likely chance that two or more people would have the same day of birth I'm talking about the same day not the year right because there are 31 days in the longest month right some months are 30 days some months are so there would be at least one, two or more people that would have the same day of birth in the month. So let's say I'm born on the 27th of the month, right? And somebody in the room, if we have more than 30 people, would also be born on the 27th day of the month, okay? Might be in a different month. Now, if you have in the whole year, you would require to have 366, right? to have at least a one match. So based on, based on the birthday attack, okay, you would have a 50% chance of having a match in the match. Okay. If you have the equivalent big size or higher. So to really prevent it or reduce the risk, we can't say prevent, right? Is to use a high bit Cash algorithm, a 512 bit or higher. This really decreased the probability of having a hash collision, which is a matching hash. Because if you're using 128 bit, there will be a likely 50% chance that you will get a hash collision. Based on right, the birthday probability or the birthday theory. So how can we increase or elevate the security? Okay, let me come back to this. I know some of you are still typing it. So let's come back to here real quick. So the birthday attack is here. The birthday paradox information is here. You can, you can read that. MD5 is accessible to that. So if you want to use something that is not accessible to birthday attack, you use SHA-3 for now, <laughs> okay? Who knows? They're, you know, it because it uses prime number and it just takes longer to compute with prime number. So you have a little bit more time in that where they won't be able to generate the probability as much. So what we can do is we can use what's called a key stretch method or known as salting. Salting has been around for a long time. For as long as I teach cybersecurity, I think 
people had always implemented this concept, but now I think it's more regularly used. So what salting mean is that random bits is gonna be stuffed into your passwords or your key, right? So what it does is it generate random bits and then set up because if they can predict the bits, then they can predict the hash. So it will stuff that into your, 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 your hash of your passwords. And what it's called is the password-based key de derivation function two, which is it does a pseudo random and pseudo random is different than random. Randomization, a true randomization is really based on your environment that could be changed in time. Pseudo random is gonna be based on something that is gonna be very static. So it's gonna seed at the same point. So for example, an application can seed at zero every time it looks random, but it's gonna give you the same sequence, the same, the same sequence repeatedly. So that just looks random. So that means it's pseudo random. So this, what it does is it's gonna salt at least 60 bits. So it's gonna use 64 bits in, and it's gonna stuff it into the hash algorithm and it's gonna generate something that doesn't look like the original hash. And so that is just going to give us a, a little bit less in the risk in, in the hash collision, okay, for passwords. Another uh, block cipher that, that is used in Linux to store shadow passwords. So when you use Debian Linux, like Kali or Ubuntu, right, you store your password, it's store your password in a shadow file. And Linux use bcrypt, which is based on Blowfish, one of the better old, you know, it was developed a long time ago. It is a block cipher encryption. So Blowfish and, you know, Blowfish is one of the stronger encryption that's out there. Okay. So here it gives you the step in the example and the comparison. Okay. So you can see. All right, before we answer the next part, make sure we know this, because I know that in a lot of the security certification, it's gonna ask you about data information. So there are three different types of data. Data at rest, those are archived data, right? Like the backup data, the, the stuff that you put away, that's not used, okay? Data in transit, those are like the web data, the email data, data in movement. Okay, stuff that goes in and out of your network. Data in use, files, things that you open on your computer. Those are the three, okay? So when you think about how you're protecting those data, you need to think about the type of encryption that goes with each category. And they are different. Because if I'm using data in transit encryption, right, for the data at rest or the data in use, it might not be strong enough, okay? But if I'm using strong encryption for data in transit, it will slow down my communication, okay? So you have to consider the, the, the resources that you're dealing with and the purpose that you're using encryption for. So there are two very important elements in encryption. People tend not to know this. The first thing is the algorithm that makes encryption different than others, okay? So those bless you. That's the mathematical equation that's applied to specific type of encryption. Second is the key and its size. Okay. So when it tells you 256 bit encryption, that's really referring to the key of that encryption. Okay. So encryption is only as strong as its key. Okay. Seriously, because if you have the key, doesn't matter how good of an algorithm it is, it is open, <laughs> it is decrypt, right? So, and then think about pseudo random, random initiation vector, especially for the wireless, because they can capture that in your, your, wire, your Wireshark packets and evaluate that. It will show pieces of your data and your key information, right? So the hash is used to protect your, to encrypt, right? Your password. The key is used to open and lock 
your infection. Separate than attached. Okay. So the nonce is your seeding number that really ties back to random and pseudo random here, right? So all of these things are in consideration when you selecting your encryption, because when you talk to people who don't know too much about security, they would say, oh, I'll just encrypt that. I'll, I'll use encryption for that. And you really have to think about like, you know, is encryption really for it? right is what kind of encryption how strong is the encryption and so on okay so encryption might not be all the solution that it cracks up to be or it could be right so it depends and so is it resilient is it crackable and so on okay and then i think i touch on block and stream already okay so when you read a type of encryption it will tell you this is a stream encryption that means bit by bit this is a block encryption that's going to be a chunk. Okay. So a group, a group of bits that's going to be set in certain size block. The larger the block, the slower it is. Okay. All right. Here are the modes. And also the modes are also different. Okay. So many things to remember, right? <laughs> okay. Electronic code book. This is used for plain text into blocks. Cypher blockchain, blockchain, this is used for crypto money right now, if you purchase and things like that, right? So this is using symmetric block cipher. It also randomized initiation vector. It uses XOR or exclusive or operations. It's really, it's really interesting. So the best visualization I can give you in one sentence is thinking about like a train, okay? Each car on the train are different. And in order to access the fifth car on that train, you have to start from the beginning and you gotta unchain it. Meaning that you have to open each of the blocks in order to get to the next block. So the only way that I, the fifth train can see is the previous block. And so that's how it's secure is because it's not able, you cannot see the whole entire thing except for the one prior. Okay, but it's very slow. Okay, and then the counter is going to be converting from block to cipher. I mean, block to stream cipher. Okay, so make sure we remember this for certification. I know I hate this too, but you have to remember these acronyms. Okay, and then your counter mode, your GCM, is going to combine the CTM, which is earlier along with the Galois mode for authentication. And it's gonna come back to how strong is the authentication to make sure that there's integrity and uh, confidentiality. Okay. We touch on symmetric already and asymmetric. So symmetric key encryption, AES is in your mobile. A anytime that you own a mobile device nowadays, like your, your, your wireless router, your smartphone uses AES. Apple started using AES a while back, right? Even on in the BlackBerry days. And so they implemented that on the lower bit size, but the current AES is at at least 128 bit for the encryption block. Okay, it is a block encryption. And so um, it is one of the top 15, okay? So if you're using AES, it's safe to say that at home, you might find your wireless router have this option where you can have AES with 256 bit or higher, even higher. But these are the common bit size, okay? It is fast. It is a one pass to encrypt and decrypt. Remember, it uses symmetric key. It is efficient. It uses less resource. It's very strong, okay? So is it accessible? If you give it time, they will be able to crack it, but you know, so I would want to pick the highest bit that I can for the wireless, especially for pub, like, you know, if it's widely used in your network. This is old, oops, sorry. So DES is a symmetric block cipher. It is a 60 bit block, small key, right? Not recommended for today. This has already been cracked long ago, 
right? And then the triple DES is just a three pass using multiple keys. It is stronger than the DES, right? It encrypts data at 64 bit block. So now when you read encryption, you're going to be like, oh, that's a block encryption. This is a symmetric type encryption. So you can see the difference. OK. All right. So this is also a block. It is a symmetric key encryption, smaller than what you see. It is not used as often as AES, but it is a good alternative. And it uses 56 bit, 112 bits, or 168 bits. So and the bit sizes are a little bit different. Okay. Ron Rivas, you know he's still alive. He goes to DEF CON once in a while. Um, this is, and this is, you know, RC stands for Ron's code. <laughs> so the fourth version is the RC4. So Ron Rivas or Ron Cypher, sometimes they call it the Rivas Cypher. This is a symmetric stream cipher between 40 to 2048 bits. It's used in SSL, TLS, or your secure website. NSA found that RC4 was broken in 2013, not too long ago, and AES was the replacement of RC4, but it was very widely used in the 90s toward the 2000s. Blowfish and Two Fish, we touch on this. This is used for shadow password in, um, in uh, Linux. Right, Wu Schneider, also a popular figure in security. Blowfish is re replaced DES, it's faster than AES, definitely. And it is a block cipher. Two fish encrypt data at 128 blocks or higher, and it is remained in the top 50. So, those are some of the symmetric encryption that you commonly see. There are so many more but you, those are the common ones. Then you got the symmetric, the asymmetric encryption, which utilize certificate and certificate authority to generate keys, such as RSA. If you ever use Raspberry Pi and use RSA authentication, uh, Ron Rivas, Adi Shamir, and, Le and Adelman created this in 1977, long ago, and it's still being used today. Right, it's definitely uh, brute forceable. <laughs> My students, they attempted it already. The key size can go up to 2049 bits or higher. It is large using prime number. This calculation takes a long time, but if you have quantum system or system that is computer being able to compute prime numbers well, RSA is reachable, okay? And so it uses two types of key. One key is a short lived key, can be used for 30 seconds or 60 seconds, or you can have a static key, which you use in Defi Helmet for or both keys. Okay. So this is an asymmetric encryption. Another one is elliptic curve and ECC. It uses very low power. This is often used for automated systems uh, like automated industrial routers, things like that, because it uses very low in power. Things that are sun powered or solar powered. It's also used, uh, it uses the PKI infrastructure. And I had to pull some stuff outside of your book to give you this, right? A lot of the things that you see here is not all in your book. So, now, ECC is susceptible to attacks. All of them are, right? So the side channel attack to differentiate the power that it receives and send can cause it to have interruption or have a fault. Um, another attack that they would use is called the twist security attack or the fault attack, where they it would, um, in the parameter, it would put in values that would cause it to have the invalid curve. And that's what they also call a, an invalid curve attack. And then Defi Hellman is on another popular one. This one uses an algorithm to exchange a shared symmetric key. So it, it elevates that a little bit. Um, it is used in a lot of internet services, okay, for security and it uses PCI infrastructure. So you don't have to acknowledge 
the send and the receiver doesn't they don't have to acknowledge each other first because it has an algorithm where you can actually exchange the key uh, swiftly okay so and then it would look something like this and so on all right so let's answer the next part Okay, so Bcrypt, we talked about Bcrypt. This is based on Blowfish block cipher used in Linux to protect shadow passwords. And then how can hash be compared? Or how can it be used to determine the integrity? Hash is compared. If it is different, then the message has lost integrity. And you know, when you're using this in email encryption, your email application handles that, right? You would install the encryption tool for your email. And if your email has been jeopardized, then it's usually simply comparing the hash and see the difference in that. Oh, did I go too far down? Okay. And then earlier, if I didn't touch on salting the password, we would just add random bits or the data that into using a, a one-way function input, okay? And then added that to the password. And so salt is just to really safeguard how the password is stored. So think of it like stuffing into something that's already been stored as already stored data. Uh, I'm sure there's a class action for that. <laughs> but you have to really determine, a, you know, a certain amount of loss to, to make it a case, right? But if there's a class part of that or if you know if the 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 pursuant wins then you if you are part of the group that was impacted i'm sure they compensate somewhat i've seen those all the time sometimes like they give you 25 dollars <laughs> um no because you have to really show that there, there's a huge block that impacted so much you know, class action, we call it that whole. And then you also have to investigate where your data was leaked to, how your data has been exchanged over so many hands and so on. You know, I'm sure you can buy a service for that, or you can go to Onion and look up where your data has gone. <laughs> In the dark <laughs> web. <laughs> yeah, you can look that up. You can find where your data has gone in the dark web if it's been sold or exchanged. Having the proper URL in Onion and find that, right? It's a search engine, so you can find a lot of things there. So I know there used to be a, there is a VPN that will show you where all the, where all your information is going. So the app that access it, it shows you where in the map those companies are handling your data and then it just goes off from there. Okay. That's so they just they just uh they just map that out, right? Yeah. Oh, I've seen those. That script is probably easy to create to visualize it. So it they use like multiple API to really and all you have to do is follow a certain extension of the data. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the service that you pay, uh, what is it called? Something lock, life lock, right? Oh. They do that. So live lock, they claim that they can go into the dark web and find your data and stuff like that. And and some of that is open source. You can you can go to like different link on Onion to be able to yeah. search for your data. And so when you put in the criteria, it just plugs it into the parameter and it's able to search that. Mm 
So it's just HTTP. So let's say uh, someone uh, is coming in the front end and they have an application. So uh huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, yeah. So, if you can prove, I mean, probably talk to an attorney, and they will tell you, right? If you can show that, you know, if that that has create a huge loss, like you know, to uh, identity theft. First, you need to file the police report and go through all the measures, right? Before it becomes like a lawsuit. So you have to have all the police records and all of that. And then you have to document the amount of loss that you pay. So let's say that they empty out your two, $300,000 account, right? And you have proof of that. So there's a lot of like areas that you have to show evidence of loss after you document it with the law enforcement people and so on right and then if they use it for credit card application and so on so you know credit reports and all of those things yeah all right so let's talk about we talked about the type of data already right so when you're using data at rest, that's the storage, the stored encrypted data, archive data, backup data, uh, data in transit that will be sent throughout the network via the web, in and out, email. Data in use that's on your computer, right? It's not encrypted. It's often open or used by applications. So the difference between the block and the stream cipher, we understand that in, when it's a block, it, incre it encrypts the size that's based on the encryption type, like 64-bit or 128-bit blocks. It would take a large file and it would divide it into chunks of bits or group of bits, and it will create block and encrypts it separately, okay? It is effective when you use it for database. And yes, database should be encrypted because they can download your whole database and find your password or your, your social security and so on. In the stream encryption, it is much more efficient. It's often used for the web. It is when you don't have a certain, a certain storage idea, right? So I don't know how much data is gonna flow in and out. So I might just use stream because I don't know the size that I need to, to set up the encryption. If it is continuous, right? It is continuous over the network and it's, and when you use the stream cipher, you should never reuse the key. Key should be renewed frequently, okay? because it is symmetric, it's shared keys to encrypt and decrypt. So if your key is captured, your data is open. Question. Question? Okay. So on the cipher mode, you can choose any of the mode that you want, but I just chose counter mode. This, allows you, your CTM allows you to convert block cipher into stream. It is, uh, it combines the initiation vector with the counter. So it is, you can copy and paste it from the notes. You don't have to type out everything, but you can summarize it as well. And it uses the result to encrypt the plain text block. So the initiation vector is the same combining with the counter value to give you a different encryption key for each block because it is randomization. It's able to generate different key for each of the blocks. So let's say your file generates five blocks. 
each block for that file has a different key because even though it uses initiation vector that's the same, but the counter value is randomized, so it's different. Okay. And so for the multiprocessor system, they should use this mode because it's able to process much faster. So for your multi-core, almost all servers are, right? Um, we should use the CTN. But you can choose any of the mode of your choice from that list. Any question? I only have a few more to go. So. What is that? Five, six times that he's been trying? <laughs> Yeah, every time that, you know, he has some kind of legal problem, he always trying to fake death and then he will wake up again and say, oh, no, wait a minute. I was just really sick. <laughs> it's very interesting. And then you can also select the type of encryption like Bcrypt, Blowfish. I use AES because it's popular and you know, it's being used in all your mobile devices and your wireless device. So I likely that your new, your AC router would have this option. So your data is encrypted into a 128 bit block. And it is one of the best algorithm from the top 15. So, you know, and that changes year to year, right? You're going to have the general one that's been around for a while, and then you've got new ones that come in. Um, there are very few institutions that, that create people that create, like, well-known uh, unbreakable encryption, like MIT research labs and so on, right? But scientists, some of the scientists you've seen some of them have been created since the 70s and still being used. So you can pick any of those for number 17. And the length for AES is 128, 192, and 256. So we pick 256 if we have extensive use of our mobile or wireless device, but the base is 128 bit. Any question? Can I move down past 15 like this? Or maybe I should zoom out a little more. Okay, a little small, right? Sorry. And then you can add more characteristics about AES, but the important part is to really understand the difference. Okay. Now, for the difference between symmetric and asymmetric, we touch on that. Asymmetric uses two types of keys, one to encrypt and the other to decrypt. So if you're using a public key to encrypt, your private key is to use to decrypt, vice versa, okay? And if your private key encrypts, then your public key would decrypt. This is used in strong encryption and your key exchange is used to transport your symmetric key. So in the case that if it needs to have key exchange, right, symmetric keys would be used to exchange those keys. So you need a key for a key. That's what I'm saying. 
Yeah. How do they send you the key without? So I would need, yeah, I would need to have the key to exchange other keys. It's kind of like you would lock a box where in that box you would put your other key, right? That you would use. And then symmetric encryption, it uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt. It's also known as your secret key encryption or session key encryption as symmetric is used for web session a lot. Anytime you see SSL TLS as symmetric. But you saw on the list, there are other type of symmetric encryption. Now, doesn't mean that it's always going to use the same key to encrypt or decrypt. Sometimes it won't, okay? But likely that the majority of the time it uses the same key. So same key is not always used to encrypt and decrypt. Key, keys are changed multiple times throughout. And so how you can elevate symmetric key security is to change its key. regularly. Any question? Hmm? What? What? Change key cryptography. Cryptography is just another term for encryption. If you do chain key, a key linking to another key. So instead of using a, a key to exchange key, you can open a key, uh, you can access a key by unlocking another key. That's how the chain key works. Remember, just slowing it down, right? That's all these technology being implemented is just us to really slow down the process in accessing that data easily. So if someone has the first key, they could eventually unlock all the keys from here, like just like generated after that. Uh, yeah, but it does take time. So I would need to unlock the second, yeah. which could be uh, yeah. So and then the second would be third, and so on. But it so it just slowed down the process in, 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 in to, instead of capturing that key originally, right? You just slow down the process. But if, if, if you change your key and you change your key, uh -huh. right? Um, but that takes a lot of resources. Pe people have to understand that these things that you implement requires time and resources. So. All right. If you have a password on the computer, you could have theoretically Well, if you have powerful system, you can theoretically break anything, right? But not everybody have, have access to the true quantum system nowadays. People claim that they have quantum system, but a lot of it is in research stage anyway, so. IBM, yeah, NASA. NASA quantum system is what closes to the quantum system as characteristics, so. Okay. Canister. Oh, maybe it's for development. I'm not familiar with canister. I'll look into it, let you know. Okay, so authenticity. So how is digital signature used to make sure that it is original, right? It is intended for a certain person. 
and you do use it more often because of COVID. You can sign for something that, and how does it know that you are who you are? Number one, it requires, right, the sign of confirm. So if you're using Adobe or, you know, those sign applications, um, basically you have to authenticate to it or you have to validate who you are who you are. Okay, so the signer can confirm the certificate that's issued digitally. And you can use the ones that's used by the OS, or you can use the third party one, like VeriSign. That's one company that's been doing digital signature sign, uh, certificate signing for a long time. So when you buy a software and you see like the, the true sign and the VeriSign, right, logo on it, all that is is that it's saying that the software tool has integrity, it's authentic. It's, in, it's made by, you know, the vendor and released to its customer and so on, okay? Now, certificate will have some expiration. There's some lifetime certificate. So when the certificate expires, right, it can go into the, we can revoke the certificate. You ever visit a website, it tells you that you cannot access this website because your certificate's not current, right? So what happens is the system, the certificate authority did not release you with the certificate. So you have to submit a request for a certificate, a CLR. So a server would then give you a certificate that will be current for your device or your user account. So certificate is really tied to an account or a device, a system, okay? Certificate authority is a server system that's used to manage, like issue certificate, remove or revoke a certificate. Think of them kind of like the DMV. The book uses a good analogy, right? The DMV can give you a license. It can take away your license, revoke your license, right? But you need a license to drive, like how you need a certificate to access your games and your website. How it can perform, it can give you integrity is that it can check the content that is digitally signed to make sure that it validates that. It uses certificate authority to really validate the certificate that is trusted, okay? That's issued by trusted entity, okay? And then non-repudiation, it has a timestamp on when you sign, who signs it, kind of like your, um, uh, notarizer right like when you sign things for court that person put a stamp on to i witness your you sign this right so the system has a way to put a time stamp on that occurrence where you sign your signature so that way you cannot deny that you are a signer okay so it's integrated between the communication of the system and the application itself Okay, any question? So before we answer 20, we have a bit of time. So I'm gonna come back here. Sorry, I'm gonna take you to the notes real quick. So digital signature is a little bit different than encryption, okay? So read this, okay? So it uses certificate authority. Um, And it would look something like this. So when you're using HTTPS, okay, it, when you use TLS and SSL, you use certificate, okay? So for asymmetric encryption, in order to exchange key, it requires a certificate. So the, the server or the system has to generate that certificate and it needs to be given to a device or a user account. Now, in a downgrade attack, what will happen is because SSL has a flaw, so when you are forcing the system to use a certain flawed technology like SSL instead of using TLS, then it becomes a downgrade attack, okay? So usually this happens, they did a lot of research, so they would say, okay, 
we will remove the option to use TLS. You can only use SSL. And for SSL attack, they would use padding on Oracle on downgrade legacy encryption poodle. <laughs> it's such a long name. The poodle attack for the server to downgrade it to SSL. And then after that, they will initiate the man in the middle attack. So it is a base attack to another attack. So to answer question 20, right? It says explain how downgrade attack against web server uses SSL TLS. They would exploit the SSL vulnerability by configuring the system. So it could not use TLS which allows the attacker to launch SSL-based attack. You can take that section and put that in there, such as padding Oracle on downgraded legacy encryption poodle attack, which is used to lead to a man in the middle attack. So when selecting your encryption, you should consider the limitation of that encryption and it would be all in their documentation and information page. Or you can ask the vendor, right? What is the limitation? The resources and the constraints, what kind of resources it use and what kind of constraints it has. Speed and time, right? We are gonna give up speed, right? For things, for resources and so on. So speed and time, how fast is it responding? What kind of performance or response we're gonna get. How long does it take to encrypt and decrypt? So when you're selecting block versus stream, right? That type plays into speed and time. Remember I talked about size matter with encryption. So size and computational overhead. There's a thing called entropy and entropy ties to randomness of the algorithm for the encryption. So if you're using things that would require random versus pseudo random, we would entail, we would look into entropy. Predictability. This can tie to random or pseudo random. Things that are environmentally factored for the input, or it could be deterministic algorithm. The key strength and length. So key strength really pertains to how long is the key. Longevity. So when you are selecting encryption, you want to double the key length. So meaning that if I, I plan to use 128 bit, I might want to consider 256 bit so that way I can extend my lifetime of my key. Because when you're using more higher bit size, what will happen is you have more combination for your key, even if it's pseudo random, right? To give you twice as long of the lifetime for your key. So you would double the bit size. And then do not reuse symmetric key for encryption. Question. Okay. And if you read the sections, it entails all of these categories and it gives you more explanation. So you can look into that. Also in the book. So leaving this class, you should have at least the basic understanding of encryption, if not detail. Okay. When you go into practice for security, you should know at least some of the common encryption, what it means, okay, how it's used. Any question? To hack a blockchain other than what
depending on who's hosting, depending on what do you mean by hack? Are you trying to breach the data? Or are you trying to just, I can do denial of service attack. And just attack the ledger. Um, I don't know. I don't think. Well, there are so. So when you say a blockchain attack, it's not just a one form of attack. You understand that, right? Well, yes, because of the ledger, and then you also have database that contains information, and then you also have keys and encryption and hashes. So performing those type of attack would entail many attacks within the comp like the composite of attack. You see? Yeah. Right. So it's still going to be a collision because it's, you know, for the ledger. Okay. So here we go. I'm going to try to go through these quick. Uh, so a centralized certificate trust model is where you would have a root certificate authority, right? That's going to be releasing the certificate to a, the intermediate or a child. So think of it like we always start with the root certificate authority, and that's going to give the certificate to the child or the intermediate and then the child. Think of it like a family, like the root certificate authority is like the grandparents, and then after that will be the parents and then the child. So the root certificate authority always going to be trusted by the other CAs. And that's how it builds out the trust model. So if my device, if my smartphone is obtaining a certificate from the child CA, which obtains the certificate from the root CA, that means that it has to trust with the child and the root. Okay. So when you're using a service like that, the VeriSign server is trusted at the root level and then they would give the certificate to let's say Oracle or Microsoft, and then Microsoft would then pass your certificate to you. So there are multiple level of trust, but ultimately you trust the, the root certificate authority, the original, okay? Oh, sounds pretty centralized. <laughs> yeah, well, the, there's always the positive and the pros and cons in that, right? So if a system, in, so, but you don't, you don't have to have like a child. You can have like the root certificate authorities gives certificate to everybody directly trusted from the root. Okay. If the system encrypts the key, uh, if the encryption key is compromised, what would happen to that certificate? So whenever the encryption key is compromised, you would revoke the certificate, remove it, disable it, right? So in the PKI infrastructure, it talks about the type of certificate that would give you the private key. So certificate would always correlate to encryption via key, right, for keys. So you would have certain certificate that's going to generate the, key, allow you to generate the key. Think of it like, think of it like in order to access the amusement park, you have to have the ticket right? Certificate is your ticket to the amusement park. And then when you get there, it's going to say, oh, based on your certificate, you're allowed to go on these rides, right? And access these restaurants, right? Like if you have the VIP at Disneyland, you will have more access compared to less, right? So the certificate for your device, for the application, it's going to say, oh, it's going to allow camera access, GIS, uh, you know, or GPS, uh, you know, microphone and so on, based on the certificate that you acquired, okay, for that application. Okay, any questions? So P12 and PFX are used for your private keys. So PGP, right, is an open source version of 
PGPG. Okay. Okay. PGP stands for pretty good privacy and it was commonly used in email. It's still commonly used today for encryption. It is used in applications such as Cleopatra, which you probably never heard of, but it is an email encryption application, right? Um, which was acquired by Symantec a long time ago. So my Google is listening to me right now. <laughs> so here's the open PGP. In, if you click on the link and you go to the email encryption, you will find different type of application that you can use for encryption. You just need to pick some, right? So for Windows, I can use Claws, which is very common, right? Everdesk and so on. So that means that I would install it on my Windows system and then use that for email. Right, it will encrypt every email. Of course, it's going to be slower than your regular email. For your Mac OS, right, Apple Mail, but you need to use the PGP tools and so on. Okay, then your Android. Then if you use iOS, Canary is very common. Okay, and and other things. Linux also can use Claw Mails and such. Okay. So select a couple of those, put them down for each of these, okay? And then that's it. Any question? And we finish with a minute to spare. Let me stop recording. If you are finished with everything, 